All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's about one o'clock and I think we've got a little less than half of the amount of people that we're going to register on. So um, I think we'll go ahead and get started with just some introductions and some housekeeping items. And by the time that we're through all of that, hopefully um, we'll have more people and we'll be ready to go. Uh, really quickly, as people are logging on, if you're having any issues, if you can't hear me, if you're unable to see what Daphne is sharing on her screen, please write a message in the chat. We've muted everybody um, to just eliminate feedback. So as you're logging on, if you're having any issues, um, please use the chat feature or you can email me and Justin directly and we'll try to help you troubleshoot. But with that, Let's go ahead and get started. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alexis Hafley, and I'm the Community Outreach and Environmental Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And I think most of you already know this, but um, if there's any of you that don't, the council was established by the Washington State Legislature in 2006 to provide policy level direction, planning, and coordination for combating Thank invasive you, species bye. throughout the state and preventing the introduction of others that may be harmful. And so with that, um, I will hand it off to Justin here in just a minute, but I wanted to go through a few housekeeping items that'll help make the webinar run smoothly. So today's webinar is being recorded currently. It will be posted on our YouTube channel as a webinar link that you can share. So if you have to miss it or you drop out or you're having any technical difficulties, um, you will be able to see it. And then lastly, we expect, we expect the webinar today to last about one hour. Um, Daphne's presentation will probably last about 35 minutes and then we'll make sure we leave plenty of time for questions and then once questions are edited we'll conclude. So again just to reiterate please make sure you are muted and remain so for the duration of the presentation. This will help avoid any unnecessary feedback or any delays in getting the presentation started. If you have questions as Daphne is going through her presentation, again, feel free to use that chat. It can be about technical issues. It can be about the webinar itself, um, any of the content that she's presenting, and then we'll go ahead and save those in for the questions at the end. Um, and then if for whatever reason, we're not expecting this, but if for whatever reason the webinar crashes or it freezes or shuts down, um, Justin and Daphne and I will work on getting the system re-going. So please try to maybe wait just a minute or two and then log back in and we'll try to just pick up where we left off. And lastly, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I know everyone's got a lot of online meetings. There's all kinds of stuff going on. So we really appreciate you um, definitely thinking about invasive species and just spending your time with us today to learn more about this awesome project that Daphne's been working on. And then with that, I'm going to hand it off to Justin Bush. He's the executive coordinator for the Washington Invasive Species Council, and he's going to give you um, a little bit more information about Daphne and the project that she's been working on for us for the last few months. So take it away, Justin. Great. Well, thanks for providing that housekeeping information, Alexis, and good afternoon, everyone. Really happy to be bringing you this webinar today and would like to also uh, parrot what Alexis said and thank you for participating. This is a really important topic and as you know we need to respond as quickly and as effectively as possible when a new invasive species is found in Washington State. The success of containment and eradication hinges on the initial response decisions that we make. And what is important about Daphne Condon's work on behalf of the Invasive Species Council is that Daphne analyzed invasive species response plans and published literature from around the globe, ranging from uh, broad national response plans to very site and species specific response plans. And this comprehensive analysis of, of those plans at different scales uh, and in different areas identified best practices and practice to is to then also avoid um, that will benefit any invasive species manager or planner. And these products that Daphne has created will be made available to you all shortly. Uh, and that will be an annotated bibliography, a white paper, and then a response framework that the council will be reviewing and perhaps adopting in the future. And these practices that have been identified will enable any invasive species manager to apply good practices to avoid pitfalls that others have found and to be more efficient and effective if and when new invasive species are found. Daphne's done a really fantastic job on this project and a huge thank you to her for this. 
and an early congratulations for successfully completing her undergraduate work. She will graduate in June, and then also after that, then start grad school. So um, Daphne, it's been a real pleasure, and with that, take it away. Thank you, Justin. I appreciate that. And thank you, Alexis, for the introduction there. Hello, everyone. My name is Daphne Condon. I am a uh, Western Washington University senior. Um, I'm in my second year, and this was my internship project with the Washington State Invasive uh, Species Council. As just, Justin mentioned, I created three documents um, that I will be briefly going over with you today, more specifically the last two documents. Uh, yeah, so let's jump right in. First of all, um, I hope everyone can see the screen right now. I think I think it's working. Uh, <laughs> this is my first time using GoToWebinar this, um, at this large of a scale, so we'll learn as we go along. So with acknowledgement that there is quite widespread knowledge on this topic, I'd like to dive in and just discuss a few of the issues that we're going to talk about today very briefly. Um, first of all, we're going to start unpacking the issue of invasive species, uh, specifically in Washington State. Then a quick note on prevention as a tactic to halt the spread of invasive species. Uh, from then, we'll move on to the rapid response framework that I've drafted and finish with a few best practices when implementing this rapid response framework. So as briefly mentioned, uh, my timeline for the work that I conducted began in December and ended just a few weeks ago. I started with um, very minimal knowledge on invasive species and rapid response plans. Uh, and so I began doing some pre-planning and my own personal research on invasive species to kind of get integrated into all of this information. I also began understanding the incident command system as an emergency management tactic. I took a few courses, ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800, to build that understanding and got certified so that I was able to create the document that I then began in January, which was the annotated bibliography. This was accumulating document of about 30 or so sources, 25 to 30 sources that featured government publications, uh, scientific journals, and other response frameworks from across the country and a couple from other countries across the globe. I also had the opportunity to participate in a few interviews with uh, response agency personnel who had experience using the um, ICS system or the incident command system in the past for other emergency response scenarios. This would be helpful um, in my future document that I would, I would be creating. And it was nice to have some, uh, you know, personal engagement with people who had actually practiced the incident command system them themselves. From January, I began to draft the second of the three large documents that I created, the white paper, which talked a bit about some best practices to use when working in a response framework. This was then finished in February, and I gathered a few more sources on invasive species as I went along to build my understanding. After I finished the annotated bibliography and the white paper, I then um, drafted and finished a response framework in March that uh, provided a accumulating set of protocol for uh, early detection and rapid response as we'll be going over in this presentation. These documents were submit um, for review by the Invasive Species Council and will hopefully, fingers crossed, be available here um, very soon. Uh, it's important to note that originally we were hoping to do a tabletop exercise with some hands-on activities. However, the current circumstance does not allow for that, and instead we have a webinar which should be able to cover all the topics um, that we would have done in the tabletop exercise. So, um, as many of you might know, uh, a lot of these terms and topics that are up here, um, I wanted to bring some to the table for you to look at really quick. Please take a look over them um, briefly. Keep in mind specifically the terms invasive species and species risk, as I'll be talking about them quite a bit in the presentation. Uh, regarding invasive species, I'd like you to keep in mind the fact that it involves plants, animals, and pathogens, not just plants and animals, as I found much of the um, the popular mainstream idea of invasive species tends to be, uh, pathogens tends to be forgotten. Um, and in species risk, the fact that it impacts all three uh, sectors of environment, economy, and human health. It's not just one, it's not two, but all three. 
So keep these in mind, take a brief look, and we'll move on from there. So what is our problem at hand? Well, taking all the different pieces of it, it actually seems to be quite a complex task. And when it's all boiled down, the problem is we're aiming to halt the spread of invasive species in our state. Now, this has been quite an ongoing problem and there's not a perfect answer, but I've put together some resources and information and studies that seem to lead to some sort of an answer to help fight against the invasives coming into our region and our state. It's also important to note that invasive species have a lot of, well, any species has a lot of unique needs um, that vary from species to species. For example, the rusty crayfish, which is an aquatic invasive species, would not necessarily have the same subsistence strategy as the gypsy moth or would not live in the same habitat. This is important to note when drafting a response framework, which is going to aim to halt the spread of the invasive species. Some things that work better for one species won't work as well for another species. Before we move into the framework, I'd like to quickly talk about prevention as a tactic to halt the spread of invasive species. Prevention can take place in the space of a more costly response plan. In some instances, prevention actually can be cheaper than a full-blown rapid response plan. Um, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, and it definitely depends on the species and the needs of resources at hand, but this can all be determined by a cost-benefit analysis. In some cases, prevention does save money in the long run, um, but despite this, oftentimes I've found in a study that prevention efforts go underfunded and underanalyzed as options to halt the spread of invasive species. If you take a look at the curve on the left side of your screen, uh, the generalized invasion curve, you can see the prevention occurs before the invasive species actually enters the region. Um, the x-axis shows uh, time and the y-axis is the area occupied by the species. So prevention isn't necessarily going to occur as the species has already taken place in the region. Therefore, it's often a gamble whether or not prevention can be put into place for um, a cost-effective uh, implementation. So at this point, it's important to conduct the cost-benefit analysis to find out whether or not prevention is necessary. So here's a few species in Washington State that are indeed here. They have made it into the region and um, they have already claim this territory and um, this means that they found their way despite prevention, despite rapid response plans. So now that they're here, what do we do? Well, what we have available to us is an early detection and rapid response plan. This is a structured, detailed document of protocol that attains to species needs in order to help halt the spread of invasive species. I've done quite a bit of analysis on early detection and rapid response documents across the country in order to determine what would work best, what has worked in the past, and what things should we look forward to in the future with early detection and rapid response plans. In this analysis, I've determined that there's five phases that seem to be quite common across rapid response plans. These phases typically go in this order and are made to most efficiently halt the spread of invasive species once they've already established. So these phases are as reads, the early detection phase, the identification and assessment phase, the planning rapid response phase, the public integration phase, and the reassessment phase. I put these together in this order to contain the invasive species, to analyze the effects of the invasive species, and importantly, to inform the public on their role regarding invasive species. We're gonna go into these bit by bit um, as they're quite detailed and I'm gonna give you a bit of an overview of my analysis on other response plans and how they play a role in each one of the phases. The first phase is the early detection phase. This phase is critical to contain species before their growth and to contain smaller populations of species before we have a larger complex group of the species in the area. Furthermore, this is the step where um, reporting occurs, where a species is found. So it's important to note that smaller, more manageable populations of species are easier to contain than a larger, complex 
population of species. For example, one fish, one invasive fish would be quite easier to move out of the um, body of water than it would a whole school of them. So this phase is actually quite possible with the correct surveillance, monitoring, and reporting resources in place. But taking this in mind, accuracy of reporting is essential. So the reporter must send in their information that they find. And this information on the subject can be description of species, description of species site, photographs of the species, habitat details, any subsistence details, uh, latitude and longitude of site, and importantly, the contact information of the observer. This is in case there's any um, mistakes of the information or if we need any more information on the species found. Uh, this can all be reported through the Washington Invasives mobile app for iOS and Android. It also can be sent into the Invasive Species Council, but it must be relayed over for the process to actually begin. So, as I mentioned briefly before, the difference and significance of early detection can be seen in one species versus a lot of them. Now here, I know if you are in Washington State, you've probably experienced the scotch broom, can get quite bad and can grow out of control like crazy. I know I have. So early detection, getting them while there's only a few is critical. Next in the step, in the, excuse me, next in the rapid response process is the early or the identification and assessment phase. And this should occur quickly after the species has been detected. This phase is essential for confirming the identity and the risk assessment of the species. So once the species has been found, it is key to identify it properly. This is because many species actually have lookalike species that may or may not be invasive. As you can see on the screen, the flowering rush does not necessarily resemble the bullfrog, but in other cases, such as with the strawberry and the mock strawberry, um, the strawberry might closely resemble the mock strawberry. However, in some areas, not necessarily here, the mock strawberry is seen as invasive. So um, the identifying factors of the species must be clear and confirmed. Some of the strategies for our identification include conducting expert analysis on the species, use of databases, GIS, or remote sensing information for the species habitat, and use of on-call experts for analysis as needed. It's important to uh, relay back the detailed information that's been taken from the reporting in order to be sure that the species that has been found is the correct one identified. Once the species has been properly identified, it's important to assess its risk. Risk assessment is the um, is determining the probability of the species to cause impact on the three sectors of environment, economy, and human health. So a species can fall into one of two categories as I determined, a high risk species or high priority, or a low risk species or low priority. Some of the categories that um, distinguish this risk can be seen on the left side of your slide. In many cases, high risk species will quickly move on to the next phase, which would be implementation of plan. However, a lot of documents that I analyzed did not have a plan for low risk species. I found this to be quite troubling as low risk species can cause economic, environmental, or human health harm. So as my, of my determination, I would suggest that the lead agency deal with low risk species on a case by case basis. These species have, since they have the capability to cause harm, um, unlike many of the other plants analyzed, they should not necessarily just be thrown away as another species. This also has to do with the funding available, and therefore I would like to suggest that it is done on a case-by-case -case basis. Lastly, I would like to inform that the apple maggot, which pictured on the screen, is not necessarily a high-risk or low-risk species. Once the risk has been assessed and determined that action must be completed, the species and the response plan uh, reviewers will move on to the planning and rapid response phase. 
This phase is critical for the plan implementation and for um, determination of a lot of the logistical parts of the plan. This phase is made to build this specific species response plan that I was speaking about earlier in the presentation. Again, for a good example, the Mediterranean white snail may not have the same species response plan as the nutrient, as they have different habits, different habitat, and different subsistence strategies. So a unique plan will, be need, will need to be made for this species that is found. Furthermore, if it hasn't been done already, leading agencies should be determined for this project. These are agencies that will need to make determination on many of the big um, going-ons in the project. Also, communication is essential. These are links that allow resources, funding, information, and personnel to flow in between the agencies impacted, and agencies and stakeholders, excuse me. And most importantly, the plan that is created must be put into action. Hopefully this is um, seen as timely as possible as invasive species tend to, or any species in general, is able to grow at quite a quick rate um, if there's no checks in place for their growth. So uh, the timeliness of this plan is of utmost importance. And lastly, for this phase, a designation on the incident command system must be made. Of the, inter of the interviewees, um, many of them spoke on a fragmented piece or portion of ICS to be quite useful in invasive species response plans. So I recommend that the lead agency hold jurisdiction to determine whether or not the incident command system in full or part or fragmented ICS be used. From my research, I also was able to determine that other plans used different structuring systems aside from ICS um, as an emergency response protocol. At any case, this should be left up to the jurisdiction of the lead agency to determine what is best for the plan and the species at hand. Once the resources have been acquired, communication established, and the plan put into action, it will move on and create something like this. These are a few examples of species response plans. The top one being a plan for the emerald ash borer in Oregon. It's a specific plan because it's made for, well, the species of emerald ash borer. The middle plan is made for aquatic invasive species in Pennsylvania, a specific type of species in a specific region. Finally, the last plan is made for the Everglades region. This plan could be seen as specific as a plan made in a mountainous or arid region would not necessarily work well with species who live in an Everglades habitat. All of these plans are very useful as um, literature review documents, and I'd be happy to share them with anyone who would be interested. Uh, they were very helpful in all of my analysis. I cited them in almost every single document. Um, very clear and critical information providing documents. Next, after the plan has been put into motion, and the next phase will uh, ensue, the public integration phase. This phase is important as the public is a player that interacts with their environment daily. That being said, if they're aware of the invasion, they can be a critical player in halting the spread of invasive species. It's important to bring awareness to the public as public outreach methods can help them um, be part of the process. Some of the methods for outreach include news releases, media events, or public notification, as well as public education outlets. When the public is aware, they have the ability to actually bring change to the plan. In a case study by Sharp, Kleckner, and DePio, there was a um, public policy that was put out for boat inspections in the New York Finger Lakes region these boat inspections were critical to halting the spread of aquatic invasive species that latched onto the bottom of boats. Um, every time the boat was to enter a new body of water, the boat must be inspected and checked for invasive species. This policy proved to be quite productive in halting the spread of invasive species to the Finger Lakes region. And finally, the reassessment phase. This phase um, comes to wrap up all of the other phases once they've been completed, as well as being used alongside some of the other phases, such as the response um, phase and the public integration phase. So 
once all of the phases have been completed, it's absolutely essential to understand the effectiveness of the response plan in whole. The reassessment phase does just this. It often looks back to see how the different components of the plan worked, what worked well, what didn't work as well, to reflect. Furthermore, it helps to adaptively plan as the response plan is going along, hence the reassessment phase can be used throughout the response plan. As things need to be changed, um, the reassessment phase aids to this and allows them to be changed. Once the plan has been completed, and the invasive species either contain, eradicated, whatever the goal of the response plan should be. Documentation and survey of the response site uh, should ensue. This is to ensure the plan's effectiveness continues. Um, this designation should be made at the discretion of the lead agency. However, much of the documentation that I reviewed suggested that a five-year maximum be done after the response plan has been completed in order to ensure that the invasive species does not come back. An extra plant also might be needed to be put into place in case there is any detrimental harm made to economy, environment, or human health. This plan would be determined um, after the original response plan has been created and left up to the discretion of the lead agency whether it needs to be put into effect. So as that concludes the rapid response plan itself, I determined a few best practices as going along the rapid response plan that one should keep in mind. Uh, these best practices were derived from the white paper I completed and built off of existing rapid response plans uh, that produced optimal results, such as the three that I um, provided for you a couple slides back. Some of these best practices have indeed produced good and um, efficient results for containing invasive species across the country. The six best practices that I determined are listed on the left side of the screen, and I'll go through them one by one with you really quickly as they are essential to understand when working with your own rapid response plan. It's important to keep in mind that many of these are most applicable in, an, in a specific invasive species response plan rather than a more broad species response plan as the one that I shared with you was. The first, Clear agency and public communication involves a quick flow of info between impacted agencies and stakeholders. This is essential in order to move resources, information, personnel, and funding between the people impacted by the project. As response plans are made under a quick timeline and often need timely action, it's important to have these clear communication outlets so that the flow of all these resources can move to their destination as quick as possible. Next, an access to necessary resources is also essential. Many response plans need equipment such as boats, traps, ropes, uh, transportation, etc. So should these resources be already in place, there will be less of a scramble to find them and uh, lose time for the rapid response plan itself. In best practice, one should anticipate resources before the project begins to the extent possible. This isn't always possible as it can be quite tricky to predict what a specific species might need in a response plan, but as best possible, it will help aid in the timeliness of the project. Next, a strong focus on detection and identification is key. As I mentioned before, some species like the strawberry and the mock strawberry tend to resemble each other, but where one is invasive and one is not. So it's important to distinguish between these lookalikes to be sure that you aren't going to eradicate a population of a, na a native species by accident rather than invasive species instead. Resources should be put towards this to ensure that this does not happen. Next, a strong pre-founded protocol system should be also put into place. These pre-founded protocols are guidelines to move the project along quickly and coherently. Structure is improved when the pre-founded protocols are in place as more of the people participating in the plan can better understand what is expected of them in the plan. Next is to secure methods for funding. I would argue that this is one of the most important best practices as many response frameworks are quite costly and require a bit of funding in order to move the projects along. In some cases, in some of the response plans that I read, 
um, problems with funding led to the halt of the project or moving the project back a year or so in order to secure funding. If this funding is already secured and in place, response frameworks can move along in a timely manner. This is important when it comes to invasive species ability to grow at a rapid rate. They must be taken care of quickly. Last but not least is a balance of protocol detail when it comes to invasive species rapid response plans. The response plan that I shared with you is more of a broad plan and features some guidelines on making your own smaller, more specific invasive species plan. So in this case, I would designate that a broad plan. There are many broad plans out there that inform on how to make a smaller plan. This can be helpful in that sense. However, it leaves a lot up to interpretation and that can create some mistakes and some problems when creating a smaller, more specific rapid response plan. On the other hand, having a very specific rapid response plan leaves very minimal room for applicability between different response plans and can sometimes create problems in that sense. I would suggest for a rapid response plan that meets somewhere in the middle or is able to um, have the best of the broad rapid response plans and the best of the very detailed rapid response plans in order to most efficiently deal with the invasive species at hand. In order to best address these invasive species threats, taking advantage of all six of these best practices is absolutely key. From my analysis of the existing rapid response plans, these seem to be quite apparent themes between each one and therefore I would suggest that these would be the best practices in order to create the new um, most efficient rapid response plan for our state. Thank you, that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me. My email is on the left side of the screen um, or Justin and Alexis can help as well. Their contact information is on there as well. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me today. I've been very excited to give this presentation to you. I appreciate it and thank you very much. Great, Thank, thanks Daphne. Uh, we'll, we'll give the council members a moment to enter their questions. We have one immediately that uh, council member Ian Sinks is asking and um, Ian referenced a Pennsylvania response plan and uh, it looked like the Invasive Species Council may have been the author. Did, um, did you see in your review anything uh, specifying the role of Invasive Species Council in implementing plans? Or can you speak more to uh, what you had heard for the best practice in terms of council involvement? Sorry, I started talking, but I muted myself. <laughs> um, in regard to the Pennsylvania Invasive Species Response Plan, there were some in, there was some involvement with the uh, invasive species council and it appeared that they definitely took on more of a lead agency sort of body for a lot of this um from what i can remember uh and i see that as being a very effective tactic as it is an agency that's very focused on this sort of invasive species work um but on the other hand i could also see it very efficient to work with other different leading agencies should the invasive species be say oh a noxious weed could be um the noxious weed board or someone who would have more knowledge on the topic uh, i believe the invasive species council specifically is a good resource for um for reporting as i mentioned earlier in the presentation um they would have quite a bit of knowledge on the current invasive species programs going on in the state but I think it definitely also depends on which invasive species is coming through um, and how, uh, what sort of resources they have at hand and what uh, their structure is, what's already been implemented. So I think depending on a, on a case by case basis, the Invasive Species Council could be effective as um, this body, this important leading body. Uh, it's definitely just depending on a few different factors. I hope that that kind of answers your question somewhat. We'll uh, let Ian uh, ask any follow-up questions uh, in chat. But one thing that, that I'd like to add to that is that some of the plans that are developed by invasive species councils are more of the broad framework type plans that could be a baseline for any invasive species response plan. 
And uh, Washington State does not currently have that. And so one thing that I think the council will be looking at at its next meeting will be Daphne's rapid response framework. And uh, potentially the council could adopt that is, is the framework for response for the state. I think that that's something that we should talk about uh, as a council. And there may be some value in taking a stance on a baseline uh, framework for response. Alexis, are Definitely. there any more questions? Yes, so next we have a question from Tim Harrington that says, early in the presentation, you mentioned how a plan would vary depending on the species complexity. Can you clarify? Yeah, of course. So in this instance, I'm talking more about um, if a species has a lot of different needs, then the way that you control the species can vary. So uh, take, for example, a species that doesn't move around a lot like um, a very uh, stable, a very controlled um, plant versus perhaps a very small bug. So it might be more challenging in some cases to contain the bug versus the weed, which the weed isn't going to run around per se. Um, so you might need different resources in place to help prevent the spread of the insect. And this can translate over to a rapid response plan where different resources are needed, different steps are needed, and um, overall different funding might be needed, personnel. So this can lead to the insect plan being a bit more complex than the plant plan. And this was something I spoke with a few um, interviewed uh, personnel that had taken advantage of the incident command system. They said in some cases, fragmented ICS was needed for these plans that weren't necessarily as complex. So I could see that being a very useful thing there in that sense, but I hope that answers the question as well. Some species will need more steps to take care of them than others might. Thank you, that's great. Again, if anybody has any follow-up questions to their original question, you can go ahead and put them, type them in that box. Um, the last question that we had is did any of the literature address any responses that did not succeed? Um, there might be some. Uh, there wasn't a lot that I necessarily took note of. A lot of the times, one of the largest struggles throughout the response plans, as I noted, was the funding, um, was securing funding. And a lot of the times they mentioned well, get your funding as soon as possible so that you don't run into the problem where you run out of funds and there's no way to progress with the necessary steps of the response plan. And I could see this as being one of the uh, failed tactics of a response plan is having all these steps in place but not having the necessary money to keep them going. Uh, a lot of the times response plans will typically show their, their finalized product but I think it's also important to have these failed steps so that future response plans can look at them and say, oh, well, this plant ended up succeeding, but this was the failures that they had to take to get there. It's not necessarily a bad thing. And I'd like to see that change with these new response plans that are coming into light. Um, there might be some out there that have more on the failures that happened throughout the project, but the three that I mentioned in this presentation were quite clear that they worked pretty well. So. <laughs> I think it would take some looking to find those. Great, Daphne, Great. I have a question um, that I'll introduce. Uh, you'd mentioned that there needs to be some decision made by the lead agency on whether or not to embrace the incident command system and to what level to, to do so. Um, for, for the agencies and the plans, uh, the, the agencies you consulted and then the plans you reviewed, where incident command system isn't used, what kind of decision-making structure was used? Some of them were, thank you, Justin, some of them were named, um, which I, I can't give you a name off the top of my head as they were pretty obscure, but a lot of the times it was similarly mirrored to ICS with um, less structure to it. And I think that sometimes that can be necessary for some response plans uh, as it just works better with different agencies but uh, I know one of them spoke a bit about um, not using ICS in regards to risk assessment and um, a high-risk species so um, 
I believe they were talking about, it, it said something along the lines of the structure allow, it didn't allow them to um, continue on with the plans that they had for the high risk species or something along those lines. There was another example of one that was saying um, they had a bit of, they had a lack of personnel um, for a, a good reason. There was less personnel working on the project whereas ICS would have designated a lot of different personnel um, that was unneeded and might have taken away for the funding of the project. So in that sense, ICS might not be as useful as it has a lot of different protocols that are necessary, um, but many of the response plans use something that was quite similar to ICS and did not give it the actual title. Great, Alexis, any final questions? Nope, I don't have any more questions in the chat box or the question box. Okay, well, um, with that, you you have our information. And if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out. Uh, I hope that this gave the council a lot to think about. Uh, I saw an emphasis on needing additional cost analyses uh, to determine the level of response and the level of threat. Uh, we saw that the, there's a critical role for public in integration, and, and I think that's something that the council needs to explore a little more. Um, in terms of determining a lead agency, we think that's pretty clear, but it will never cease to uh, be surprised when an armadillo, for example, gets reported and we scramble. And so while I think that by and large, we're doing a great job uh, preparing for these things. I think that Daphne's pointed out some things that we need to dig deeper into. So look forward to doing that. And um, we'll uh, pass it over to Alexis and Daphne for any closing statements. Uh, yeah, again, everybody, this is going to be recorded and we do hope to have it posted shortly. Um, so again, if you had to step out at any point in time, don't worry, we're going to have this information later. Make sure to copy down my information and then Daphne's information for any follow up questions or if you had any questions about the materials that she's produced for us. Um, that's the best way to get in contact for the both of us is email for probably the foreseeable future. but. Otherwise, thanks Daphne, you did an amazing job. I'm so excited you got to share this project with everybody. Um, Daphne's been a lot of fun to work with, so this has been a pretty cool project that she's been involved with. So thanks everyone. Yes, well Daphne. done Daphne, thank you so much. Thank you, yeah, thank you Justin, thank you Alexis. This has been great. I really appreciated getting to work with you guys and I've loved working on this project. It's given me a lot to think about, especially not having any experience with invasive species before. And now I feel like I know quite a bit and I'm very thankful I got to do it. And I'm thankful for everyone on here that has shared their time to listen to me speak today. It's been four months of work and I'm really glad I've gotten to share it with you today. So thank you. Um, thank you everyone and Justin and Alexis and the council. Great. Well, we'll definitely keep checking in as we take your products and then implement them. And I think that's our next challenge and uh, look forward to doing that and giving you the results. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Great. Take care, all. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye. Thank you.